been a lot of talk, especially from Mr. Harper, the Prime Minister, about coalitions, about scary, dangerous, reckless coalitions. So I thought I'd just start by reminding us all today that back in 2003, when Stephen Harper was the leader of the official opposition, he was very upset that Canada did not join a reckless, deadly coalition of the willing that was invading Iraq in March 2003. Um, so that's the coalition our Prime Minister wanted to join back then. He actually wrote a letter in the Wall Street Journal the day after the war in Iraq started, pledging uh, allegiance to the United States war, if you will, and regretting that Canada did not take part. And, uh, Shame on Mr. Harper. And you'll remember Mr. Ignatieff back then in 2003, uh, he was writing talking points for the White House war in Iraq uh, and writing long essays in the New York Times and other publications advocating for the invasion of Iraq. And I think looking back at 2003 and where our political leaders stood then, we understand why there has been a coalition of the liberals and conservatives to keep us in Afghanistan. First, we were going to leave in 2007, then they extended it to 2009, and then they promised that absolutely by 2011, every Canadian soldier would be brought home and we'd end our part of the occupation there. Well, they lied. Ignatieff and Harper teamed up again in a coalition to extend this war and Canada's role into it till the end of 2014. And who knows, who knows how long beyond that. So shame on those, those coalition of warmongers that have been had in Ottawa. We need a different kind of coalition and we have the, the makings of it here today and in our anti-war work over the years. It's a coalition of, of communities uh, who are struggling around the world, like the Tunisian people, the Egyptian people, the people in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, in Morocco, the Palestinians who are bravely facing down the Israeli fighter jets even these past few days, uh, the Iraqi people who have been standing up. That's the, the coalition we want to be part of, is the coalition of people power standing up for self-determination and against occupation and war. Yeah. As mentioned, I'm with the Stop War Coalition here in Vancouver, uh, which is part of a, a pan-Canadian peace network called the Canadian Peace Alliance. Um, I just wanted to give a plug for a new campaign that we're launching um, across Canada with the Harper government that prefers to spend money on warships and fighter jets uh, to spending it on human needs, healthcare, education, and so forth. Um, we've launched a campaign. Um, we're applauding for the campaign against the Harper government, right? Uh, <laughs> but thank you. Um, so the campaign is called Peace and Prosperity, Not War and Austerity. So we have a few postcards. Please pick one of those up uh, on your way out, and you can also check the Stop War table to see about how you can get involved in the, uh, the local anti-war movement if you're interested. We want to stop Harper and also stop the war. Um, so without any further ado, um, oh, and just coming up also in the program today, we have Gail Davidson. Um, let's hear it for Gail, who's been leading the efforts to have George Bush, Dick Cheney, uh, and others held to account for war crimes. I know you all know the, the need for um, uh, us all to make time in our lives for um, advocacy and for working in our community for positive change, but I want to spend the first five minutes just highlighting some of the really horrific things in case any of you are, are um, uh, thinking that we don't have to gear up uh, right now. And these are all things that have happened um, under the Harper regime, so I'm just going to pose all these uh, a number of a really awful questions to you. Um, and Kat, the uh, questions of, of uh, the, the, some of the comments of Kat relate to one of my questions. Um, why over a hundred years since we stole their land and forcibly took over their uh, resources, our First Nations people still discriminated against, against and have poor access to education, employment, housing, medical care, water and sanitation, um, and uh, the services than any other Canadians. Study after study proves that. Why are 25% of the children in BC living below the poverty line? Why is the gap between the poor and the fabulously rich growing faster in Canada than in any other developed country in the world? Why is Omer Cotter still chained to the floor of a windowless cement cell in Camp 5, the very worst camp in Guantanamo Bay prison, a year after accepting a fraudulent plea bargain. Why are Iraq war resistors still not allowed to stay in Canada after Parliament voted twice 
in June um, 2008 and March 2009, and 64% of Can Canadians approved. Instead, the Harper regime issued an operational bulletin making it more difficult for war resistors to even get into Canada. Why was Harper able to scupper Bill C-393 after 70,000 Canadians petitioned for the bill, and that bill was approved by Parliament? Uh, the NDP, the Bloc Québécois, and the Liberals voted uh, to a person for the bill, and 26 members of the Conservative voted. That bill would have ensured that Canada would provide low-cost generic drugs for people in poor countries dying of AIDS, TB, and malaria, and the lone opposition opponents to that bill were the pharmaceutical uh, companies. It was scuppered by getting installed and then voted down in the Senate. Why did Canadian officials, paid, people paid by uh, us and acting for us, participate in the illegal detention and torture of Meher Arar, Omar Khadr, Abdullah Al-Maki, Mayuad Nurindan, and Aman Abdu Al-Maki? These shameful facts have been established by Canadian courts and Canadian commissions of inquiry. Why did the Harper regime get away with ditching the Kyoto Protocols in 2006? with the excuse that the Kyoto Protocol, the Kyoto Accord was a socialist scheme, said Mr. Harper, designed to suck money out of rich countries. Why is Canada spending unimaginable billions to purchase killing equipment, $30 billion on new military ships, an unknown amount on stealth bombers, thir another $30 billion on F-35 fighter jets, and committing Canada to more illegal and immoral wars against more defenseless people around the world. How have Canadian pol political leaders got away with lying to Parliament and to the world about the treatment to which people taken to prison in Afghanistan were exposed for the last six years? And globally, a couple of questions. Why were over a million Iraqi people slaughtered in an illegal war? And why are the people who authorized and orchestrated that genocide welcomed into Canada and shielded from Canadian law by our politicians, our police, and our attorneys general of BC and of Canada? Why are almost one half of the largest economic entities in the world corporations answerable to no one and driven solely by profit motives? In, uh, just, just to let you know of some gruesome facts, Exxon is bigger than Chile and Pakistan, the, the, the economy, so-called economy of Exxon. General Electric, Electric is bigger than Nigeria. Why are Canadian mining companies the worst offenders in environmental, human rights, and other abuses around the world? And finally, why was, this, why was the Harper regime re-elected by us after being found in contempt for refusing to provide Parliament with the documents necessary to estimate the cost of three huge ticket items that would cost Canadians not only in dollars, but in um, every other aspect of their social programs. Number one, a sweeping so-called law and order bill. Um, number two, the purchase of a fleet of stealth jets to kill more people. And number three, corporate tax cuts. The answer, that all happened partly because we allowed them to do it all and partly because the parliamentary system's been hijacked by corporate interests and, um, oh, thank you. That's very good. Well, I'm very good on my time because now, <laughs> thank you, now if you can tell me when one is up. In any event, um, it happened because some of us would rather um, um, continue having more and keeping more and getting more and some of us if we're uh, for some of us if we're concerned about security at all, at all and rights we're concerned about our own right and entitlement to keep what we have and to keep others from getting it Canada as you all know has an environmental footprint of um, uh, many times 20 times more than the resources um, available to service our environmental footprint. So that means that we're living on the, with our footprint, our boot actually, on the necks of other people around the world. So what we have to do today, what we all have to um, do in the coming year is make time in our lives to shrink our environmental um, footprint, to shrink the damage we do, and to improve the good that we do. And so what can we do? What can one person do? There's a saying, I think it was a saying of Margaret Mead where she said that, you know, all change takes place because of the event, because it, it is all seeded by the passion of one person, and I very much believe that's true. Um, when I look around in the work that I do, I also run an organization called Lawyers' Rights Watch Canada, and we do human rights campaigns around the world, and that's pretty much
the scene that takes one person. So what, what I would um, uh, call on people here today is to just start doing anything, to, to think what is your issue, what is the issue where you personally have something besides time, some talent, some knowledge that you can um, devote to uh, progressive change on that issue and then become an expert on it. You'd be surprised how little the people that govern us and the people that make decisions for us know about anything. So become an expert on some issue and then you become the advisor to, the, to your elected representatives and you become the purveyor of knowledge to the other people in your community. Um, I've been working for, and, um, I, and, and then work with other people on whatever it is that you choose to work. I've been working, for instance, on the George, keeping George Bush out of Canada or having him prosecuted since 2004. I've also been participating in efforts in other countries around the world to prosecute other members of the Bush administration. And this time, this visit of Mr. Cheney and Mr. Bush to Canada, we made um, what I think is quite a bit of headway, and we made quite a bit of headway in the education sector. That's always got to be a large part of your work as a, as a, a justice ad advocate. You have to be educating people about um, what are their uh, what are what do they have a right to? What should be, and how you could achieve that? And this time, I think that uh, uh, we were successful, and, and we saw that we the, the group of us, large number of people that have been doing this, have been successful in, in uh, raising the knowledge level of police, not of parliamentarians. We still haven't done that, and journalists. And this time. Um, many groups came together from around the world and two big groups, one Canadian one and one New York based one, actually were able to lay criminal charges against George Bush on, in Surrey Provincial Court uh, this Friday. This Friday? Thursday. Thursday was the day he came, wasn't it? <laughs> and this morning a friend of mine phoned me who, who lives in Surrey and said, you know, I've been wanting to read you, I've saved you all these clippings, I've been wanting to read you the, the letters to the editor. So he read me these letters to the editor, he read me about four or five of them that were in the Surrey newspapers. And I was on the other end of the phone just like grinning from ear to ear because every one of the letters had a very accurate um, summary of what the law is uh, uh, in Canada with, with regard to uh, torture and, and war crimes. In other words, the, the law is, thank you very much, um, as you probably all know, uh, that um, suspects like George Bush either have to be barred for Canada, but from Canada, and if he crosses the border, Canada's legal duty is to ensure that he's prosecuted either here or extradited to another country to do so. And all of these letters outlined it, so I just thought, hooray, so we're, <laughs> we're winning a small uh, part of the battle because now there's all these other educators out there, all these other people who know what should be and are striving to achieve that. Thank you very much. We've had the, the Canadian involvement in, in the war in Libya. And we've been here, many of us, uh, every week or most weeks with our Libyan brothers and sisters here who have been fighting for years against a, di a dictatorship in Libya that have been... Okay, sorry, I'm not loud enough apparently. Um, on Libya, we have the government of Canada all of a sudden has presented itself as being on side of the people in Libya who are struggling to overthrow a dictator. But let's remember what involvement Canada has had with Libya and Gaddafi this past decade. SNC-Lavalin, a major Canadian multinational which has an office here in downtown Vancouver, has been building a, a huge new prison in Tripoli for the Gaddafi regime with the support of the Canadian government. That's what we've been doing in Libya. Suncor, formerly Petro-Canada, paid a huge billion dollar payoff, aka bribe, to the Libyan government for oil contracts. This was during the Liberal government of Paul Martin. This is what Canada has done in Libya. So, and Canada continues to look out for its corporate, its corporate interests in Libya. We have to be very suspicious and skeptical of the Canadian government's involvement there. I think just like in Afghanistan, Canada under Harper, under previous governments, they're not interested in peacekeeping, they're interested in keeping a piece of the profits from oil and other resources in these countries.
lives. So shame on Stephen Harper and shame on, on Canada for heading up the NATO bombing in Libya and, and its involvement in Afghanistan as well. Now one, one issue we have heard about in the election, and I'll finish up on that, is the F-35s. Um, Canada wants to, to buy more fighter jets. They want to spend $30 billion on more fighter jets. And we're here to say, today to say very clearly, no to new fighter jets. No. no. So we say F-35s, no. Schools, yes. F-35s, no. Schools, yes. Fighter jets, no. Hospitals, yes. Fighter jets, no. Hospitals, yes. Fighter jets, no. Child care, yes. Fighter jets, no. Child care, yes. Other things we want, other things they could be spending uh, the $30 billion on fighter jets are, why don't they look in their own backyard if they're interested in humanitarian intervention and provide clean water to indigenous people right across this country who are suffering boil water warnings every day in dozens of communities around this country. So shame on the Canadian government. And one last thing, I guess I should talk a little more just quickly on Afghanistan because it's worth remembering that Harper actually prorogued Parliament uh, at the very end of 2009. There was a prorogation of Parliament for a month and a half by Stephen Harper. And what issue was it that Harper wanted to lock up, wanted to sweep under the table, and it wasn't discussed in Ottawa? It was the issue of war crimes and torture of detainees in, in Afghanistan with Canadian complicity. So it's worth remembering that Stephen Harper went to the extent of shutting down Parliament to try to shut down discussion of the issue of torture in Afghanistan. So it's a real shame, it's a real shame that this election campaign, all the parties seem to have prorogued discussion of Afghanistan and foreign policy. Uh, and we've seen that the, reali the reality of, of Canada's presence in Afghanistan is not just torture, it's bombing from the sky that has killed civilians, countless Afghan wedding parties have been massacred, last month children collecting firewood, nine of them, nine children were massacred by NATO bombers. Um, every week we see massacres in Afghanistan by these fighter jets, the same kind of fighter jets that Stephen Harper wants to spend billions of dollars more on. Uh, we should all take inspiration from that people power, and we should remember that regime change belongs at home. So let's make a regime change here at home. I think Gail and, and Bridget are going to provide um, a real wealth of, uh, of inspiration and ideas about our activism going forward. And uh, they've both, um, you know, been, been in the headlines for, for very good reasons uh, in the last few months, um, doing our best uh, against the powers that be. I'd like to tell you a bit about um, my story and sort of more of the long-term uh, motivations for, for taking action. And I, I came to Ottawa wanting to be a parliamentary page. And I really saw it as a way to, you know, move my way up into the government. And I thought that the way that we make change was, was through our parliament. And as I, I worked in government, uh, under the Harbour majority, or under the Harbour government, I saw that change was not happening there, and actually our government was perpetuating massive injustice, um, undermining indigenous rights, expanding the tar sands when we need to be moving in exactly the opposite direction, uh, sabotaging climate negotiations, undermining workers' rights, just devastating and frustrating uh, to see his agenda go forward and and I realized that I needed to do something and I could no longer work for a government who was committing these injustices and the, the first time that I had the idea to take action in the Senate itself uh, was when the Senate uh, rejected the climate change bill, which already was incredibly weak. Um, and then, in a completely unprecedented action, um, they, they rejected this bill, and I said, okay, I need to do something right now. Uh, you know, and I thought about a number of different things like, oh, what if I could, you know, put tar sands water in the cups of the senators? <laughs> but then I thought, well, that wouldn't have much of an impact. You know, it would only reach the, the small parliament uh, culture or bubble. Um, so then, 
eventually Harper got his majority government. It was extremely discouraging for so many of us. Uh, his agenda goes against the majority of the values of Canadians. And so I thought to myself, what can I do? What, what power do I possibly have to um, make an impact? And so that is when I decided that I wanted to hold up the sign in the Senate uh, to stop Harper. And I really think that this agenda is is one that we cannot underestimate. Um, and we really see already uh, Harper's agenda go forward. And it's incredibly unsettling. I mean, we see with the omnibus crime bill that he has now uh, put on the table, who is that going to benefit? Uh, and who is that going to punish? It's, it's devastating because it's really young people who are going to be at the brunt of this legislation. And it's the most marginalized people who are going to be thrown into jails. Uh, um, you know, rather than dealing with the root causes of problems, he is completely um, neglecting uh, neglecting them and in fact rather than dealing with inequality he's actually expanding uh, inequality and we've really seen how he has used the economic crisis as a justification to implement his austerity measures and you know he continues to cut public services and cut public jobs and we are only going to see more of that and he says that he has to cut these services because he needs to deal with the deficit and because we need the money. But we have the money, it's just that he is spending it billions of dollars on fighter jets, on expanding wars, uh, rather than on us and on education and healthcare and childcare and what we really need. So. So what are we going to do about this? It can be very discouraging and we're often told by our society that we don't have any power and that we can't change things. And I think that this is actually the biggest barrier that we face is this myth that there's nothing that we can do. And we often hear that young people are, are apathetic and they, people point to the low voter turnouts um, as evidence of this. Um, but in fact, I think a lot of young people care deeply about our society and what's happening. Uh, it's just that they don't feel that they are represented by uh, these uh, structures. And so they are using other means of taking action uh, through activism. And I think this is incredibly important work. And I think that once we see that power uh, does not just operate from the top down, but it also operates from the bottom up. That is when we will be able to make uh, fundamental changes. Uh, and it's really when we understand that, in fact, those at the bottom do have power that we're going to see change. And I find a really useful concept to understand this is the consent theory of power, where those at the top only have power uh, because we obey them. And powerful structures and government um, are supported by certain pillars and that are used to hold up their authority. And when we revoke uh, our obedience and revoke our consent, 
that is when we chip away at uh, the government's authority uh, and the authority of structures uh, in order to shift power uh, back to us. On another note, I think that what is also important to think about is not only that democracy goes beyond the ballot box, um, but also that we need to think of creative ways here in Canada uh, that we can make our messages heard. So to really think outside the ballot box and to be creative. It was really interesting because after the action in the Senate, uh, a lot of people said that it was very disrespectful and that it was trampling on democracy and these sorts of things. Um, but I really think that we have a responsibility to dissent when we are faced with grave injustices from our government. Um, and just like Adi David Toto wrote in his text on civil disobedience, um, when there are unjust laws, you have to break them. And when we are seeing the massive injustices we are seeing, uh, for example, the fact that CEOs make in one day what the average Canadian makes in one year. We need to take action and we need to take matters into our own hands because our government is failing us and we need to take that leap uh, together. And I really think that there are a lot of ways that we can engage in nonviolent resistance. And we've seen in, in the past historically how nonviolent resistance has really led uh, fundamental change. Uh, like uh, in India, in their movement for independence, uh, with the civil disobedience against the, the salt taxes, uh, with the civil rights movement in the United States, I really think that that is how our movement needs to be. It needs to be about us taking responsibility for our society and that's what's beginning to happen. And it is just so amazing to see this collective awakening. And And I really think that we have the power if we decide to take that leap. And I, I can't wait to build this movement to stop Harper, to stop war, to stop economic inequalities with you.